long as I am Attorney General of the state of Arizona, no woman or doctor will be prosecuted under this draconian law. What in your view constitutes the primary threat to freedom and democracy at home? Donald Trump. We have been very clear about our deep and abiding concerns about a Rafa operation and our belief that there are better ways to deal with the strategic threat Hamas poses. Hi, I'm Scott McFarland in Washington, and welcome to America Decides on what was a very busy day and a busy start to the week as lawmakers return today from their recess with a long to-do list that includes passing federal funding to address the deadly bridge collapse in Baltimore to many other items as this week begins. It was Maryland Governor Wes Moore meeting with the state's congressional delegation and with Biden administration officials on Capitol Hill today. Lawmakers said an emergency funding bill will be introduced very soon. To help address the disaster. Meanwhile, the Arizona Supreme Court ruled an abortion ban from 1864 can be enforced. It will be a major topic in one of the most hotly contested U.S. Senate races in the nation this fall. That's between Republican Carrie Lake and Democratic Congressman Ruben Gallego. Robert Costa, Daniela Diaz join us now to talk about all this. Bob is CBS News' chief election and campaign correspondent. Daniela, congressional correspondent for Politico. Bob, let's start with Arizona. Potentially a seismic issue in the presidential race there, in the Senate race there. What's your read of it? Uh, this is just the latest marker in the 2024 campaign where abortion rights is coming to the fore of the national debate. Yesterday, I spent the day covering Vice President Kamala Harris as she traveled to the battleground of Pennsylvania. And what did she do in her remarks before she got on Air Force Two? Talked about abortion rights, talked about former President Trump. Abortion again, bringing this back into the center of the debate for Democrats, especially my top sources in the party, they say that they want to keep talking about this issue and that abortion really shows how Roe v. Wade being overturned upended what they believe is women's reproductive rights across the country. They want to make sure they have a laser focus on this to activate their core coalitions and others in the coming months. And just moments after the Supreme Court ruling, the questions were directed at Senator Mitch McConnell during his press conference today. Let's listen to what Senator McConnell had to say. I haven't taken a look at it yet, but I'm certain, as you are, that this whole issue will continue to unfold during the course of the campaign. Nothing terribly unequivocal from Senator McConnell for his thoughts there. That may be the reality for Republican leaders right now, Daniela. What's your read on how this impacts the Senate race, which, of course, is pivotal there, too? Well, and you saw Carrie Lake come out and and endorse a 15-week ban and come out against the Arizona ruling, which is incredibly telling about how things are right now in Arizona. It's going to be probably the most decisive issue ahead of November. Not only that, of course, immigration in, in Arizona, but it's telling that a lot of these Republican senators, I've chatted with dozens in the last two days since Trump came out with these comments, are skittish about commenting on this. And a lot of them are saying we agree with Trump, even those that backed Lindsey Graham's 15-week abortion ban in Congress to just two years ago. I mean, Lindsey Graham himself is furious and feuding with Donald Trump on social media. So this is really, really going to be tricky for them. And Senator Graham today asked about Donald Trump's rebuke of Senator Graham's rebuke of Donald Trump, said yep. the country's with him. Senator Graham thinks the nation supports his position that a 15 week ban is the right policy move. How do you read the Senate's view on abortion? and a federal ban right now. I think they're figuring that out in real time. I mean, we just saw McConnell really not give a direct answer, saying he hadn't even seen the, the decision. That's probably, he, of course, probably saw it. It's, it's tricky. I have, like I said, spoken to dozens of Senate Republicans who are all over the field on how to handle this. Uh, some of them said they you know, texted Trump after and said that they endorsed and were happy with his comments. A lot of them uh, saying that they obviously agree with him, but it's not the best position for some of these lawmakers to go into November without a definitive stance on abortion, and Trump kind of left it to them. Such a remarkably thorny issue at this moment in time. I think the fact that it coincides in Arizona, Bob, with a ballot measure on abortion mm -hmm. makes it particularly volatile, doesn't it? it? It really does, and all eyes are going to be on Arizona. This was already one of the most hotly contested Senate races in the country. Let's move to an issue that's not supposed to be thorny. It's not supposed to be tricky. Emergency relief money for Maryland. Any other time in Congress, those things tend to move swimmingly. 
and swiftly. Mm -hmm. But there's concern. It gets tied up in what is already a gridlock Congress. Governor Wes Moore met with the congressional delegation today. Let's listen to what the governor had to say after the meeting. The meeting today was very emblematic of the kind of support that the state of Maryland has had from the very beginning. Because about two weeks ago, a part of our soul fell into the Patapsco River. Does this have the potential to get tricky, or am I, am I misreading the situation? Sometimes a picture tells a thousand words. Uh, if you look at the image we just saw of Governor Westmore of Maryland, who's standing behind him? Congressman Andy Harris mm -hmm. of Maryland, one of the arch conservatives in the House, a member of the Tea Party Caucus, an ally of former President Donald Trump to some extent. And he's there standing with the Democratic governor of Maryland because, as you said, uh, for many involved with this issue, infrastructure, this bridge is a bipartisan issue. And, and there's a, a human side to this story. I, I actually just coincidentally flew over the Baltimore mm -hmm. Bridge last night, and it's jarring, devastating to see this gap in the water. And you can see that if by Andy Harris being there, by the Democrats, uh, the Democrats in the delegation all coming together, Secretary Buttigieg there on Capitol Hill, they're trying to come up with some consensus. It's going to be a negotiation to some level, but I'd be surprised if they just let this linger in an election year. The Freedom Caucus, the conservative members of the Republican conference, made clear what they don't want. They don't want this spending to go even for a vital issue, without cuts elsewhere to help pay for it. They don't want any of those pieces of the bill that may require union labor or other regulations that oversee major projects. Where does this go from here? Well, Andy Harris just said you know, hours ago during that press conference that he plans to talk to his colleagues on the, in the House Freedom Caucus and trying to convince them that this is really important. I spoke to David Trone recently as well about this issue last week, and he told me that this is a bipartisan issue and he's going to pitch it that way. This is affect, This is jobs. This is affecting Americans. That is the largest import, that bridge or that port for cars in the country. They're going to really emphasize those things as they go forward. But Andy Harris, of course, really emphasizing that there needs to be cuts on regulations so they can move this quickly. And I expect that's what we're going to hear from him going forward. The congressional week just began. They've already rumpled up and thrown out the calendar. There will be no presentation tomorrow of impeachment articles against Homeland Security Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas. The Senate won't take this up till next week. Um, where does this head? Does it head anywhere productively, politically, for either side? This is not an issue I'm hearing about from voters when I'm on the campaign trail. They talk about border security, but they haven't personalized it to the extent that congressional Republicans have with this impeachment process against Secretary Mayorkas for Congressional Republicans, this could be a moment to continue to talk about the border, to cast blame on the Biden administration. But Mayorkas is not someone who's well known. Uh, so they've picked a target that's well known in Washington, but not in the country. It's a focusing agent for the party. But uh, when I talk to Republican strategists, they really see this as a way to rouse the core Republican vote across the country rather than convince people nationwide that there's somehow a real gap in the Biden administration's policy. From your reporting, Daniela. Why do you think this thing got moved? It's a relatively provocative move to shift something off the calendar you had great plans on moving on this week. Well, Scott, you and I both know, but maybe people back home don't know, that Congress tends to only work usually Tuesday to Thursday. And Republicans really want to emphasize that this is happening as just adding to what he said uh, and try to really rally up the base. And that's why they're, instead of sending it over tomorrow as what plans, they want to start the week with it next week and really drag out the news cycle so that it, they could reach voters back home and so that they know that this is happening. And Democrats are going to try to dismiss this. Republicans are going to try to stop that. Bob, the sources you talk with consistently, the Republicans want to talk about some variation of border security. They're playing in their space when they have some form of this conversation. That's it's, We're going to hear about this the rest of the campaign season. A lot of what's happening with Secretary Mayorkas is about the leadership in the House trying to make sure that the right flank feels satisfied with the new speaker Mike Johnson, who's facing such a political crucible almost every day in terms of his own political survival. By moving forward on some of these fronts, he's satiating the political appetites of those who might have questions about his leadership. But it seems like that appetite is never fully satisfied by those who continue to criticize him. Just a moment left, Daniela. What's your estimate as to when somebody makes a move, when Marjorie Taylor Greene makes her move on Mike Johnson? That is to be decided because she I don't even think she's really figured out yet when she plans to do that. I really think this is going to be a very similar situation. I've written about this to what Mark Meadows did to John Boehner. Mm -hmm.
um, that time when he dusted off that when that little to known motion to vacate. Uh, and I think it's going to be held over Speaker Johnson's head. And that is the intention from Marjorie Taylor Greene to remind him, I have this. I can trigger it at any point. So you got to listen to me. Daniela Diaz, Robert Costa, thanks for covering a lot of ground. We appreciate you. Japan's prime minister has arrived at the White House to meet with President Biden. He's stopping by ahead of tomorrow's official visit and state dinner. The two leaders are set to discuss their shared concerns about rising threats from China. The prime minister has also been invited to address a joint meeting of Congress on Thursday. Vice President Harris met with families of Americans taken hostage by Hamas during the October 7th attack. Our Weijia Zhang joins us from the White House to talk a bit about that. Big meeting, Weijia. What do we know happened in the meeting? Well, afterwards, uh, the family members who met with the vice president said that this was a very productive meeting, and they certainly find comfort in the fact in knowing that the U.S. government says they are doing everything they can to bring their loved ones home. And the vice president reiterated that this is a top priority for the administration and that they are trying every avenue they can. Of course, it is not up to them, but they have been trying to broker a negotiation. In fact, over the weekend, the CIA director, Bill Burns, was in Cairo, Egypt, trying to work out a deal uh, with Hamas, which has made public statements since that meeting, Scott, actually calling it a setback and rejecting the terms as they stand so far. So even though there has not been progress on that front, according to Hamas, uh, the administration here says they still believe that important work is being done to try to hammer out the details so they can bring these Americans home. From your reporting, are you noticing a shift in either the tone or the content of what the administration is saying about Israel? Certainly, Scott, for several weeks now, the administration, and in particular, the president himself, has been much more willing to criticize Israel's strategy and to say there must be a change going forward. Um, whether Netanyahu is receiving that message is not exactly determined, but it sure seems like since his conversation with the president, he has made moves in opening more humanitarian corridors and getting aid into Gaza quicker and vowing to protect humanitarian aid workers and civilians. But of course, that is the big question, because on the other hand, Scott, they are still planning a military offensive uh, on the city of Rafa, which has one million civilians there. And the administration is watching that extremely closely, having meetings, trying to convince Israel to do it in a more targeted way and not a full-scale ground invasion. So they're definitely turning up the pressure to change course. But Netanyahu says he's already set a date for that ground invasion. And just today, the National Security Advisor said the Israelis has, have not shared that date with the U.S. yet. Weijia Jiang, the White House, thank you very much. Stay with us on America Decides. Later on in the program, one of those family members who met with the vice president joins us to talk about his impression of the meeting. But first, President Biden says his Republican competitor is the biggest threat to U.S. democracy. Next, we assess his latest warning about former President Donald Trump. You're streaming America Decides. Welcome back to America Decides. President Biden is calling his predecessor the biggest threat to U.S. democracy. Take a listen to his latest warning about Donald Trump. What, in your view, constitutes the primary threat to freedom and democracy at home? Donald Trump. Seriously. Donald Trump talk, uses phrases like, you're going to eviscerate the Constitution. He's going to be a dictator on day one. CBS News contributor and anchor for Televisa Univision, Enrique Acevedo, who spoke with the president, is with us now. Enrique, what news did President Biden make in the interview? Well, we spoke on a wide-ranging uh, um, list of, of issues from his speech, of uh, his State of the Union speech, where he talked about how freedom and democracy were under assault at home to the events of January 6th, but mainly about Latino voters. President Biden needs the support of Latinos, specifically in states like, in states like Arizona and Nevada, where we uh, traveled with the president to see how Latino, Latino members of the Latino community were reacting to his message. 
Um, there, President Biden talked about issues that are top priorities for Latinos. Of course, immigration, that's not necessarily the most important issue, but it has to do with identity, um, uh, access to health care, preventive care, access to affordable housing. Uh, uh, like I said, uh, wide-ranging issues. Um, he also talked about, when we asked him about that State of the Union address, uh, what specifically uh, he thought was the main threat to freedom and democracy at home. And this is what he said. The idea that he would sit in the office, and I'll show you before you leave, off the Oval Office and watch for hours the attack on the Capitol and the destruction and the mayhem and the people who were killed, the police officers who died, and call them political heroes, call them patriots, and saying that if he gets elected, he's going to free them all. So Donald Trump, that was that was his answer when we spoke about the main threats to freedom and democracy, freedom and democracy at home. Um, we spoke about the border, how he's been criticized by Republicans for not doing enough to secure the border. Um, this after his administration spent months negotiating a tough bipartisan bill that dramatically increased border protections. So uh, I think President Biden is trying to first acknowledge that he needs the support of, of Latino voters, um, that the road to the White House, the road back to the White House goes through El Barrio, and that in order to get their support, it's not just about uh, economics, jobs, uh, wages. It's also about issues like education and even gun safety, which we also spoke about. Um, we. Like I said, traveled with the president to Arizona, Nevada, but we also sat down with him in uh, the Roosevelt Room of the White House and in the Oval Office. Um, part of the interview was on, on, on uh, foreign policy, and we asked him about Prime Minister Netanyahu and the increasing protests in Israel calling for his resignation. I asked President Biden if uh, Pre Prime Minister Netanyahu was more concerned about his political survival than he is about the national interest of his people. This is what President Biden said. Do you think at this point, Prime Minister Netanyahu is more concerned about his political survival than he is in the national interest of his people? What I will tell you is I think what he's doing is a mistake. I don't agree with his approach. I think it's outrageous that those four, three vehicles were hit by drones and taken out on a highway where it wasn't like it was along the shore, it wasn't like there was a convoy moving here, et cetera. So I, what I'm calling for is for the Israelis to just call for a ceasefire, allow for the next six, eight weeks total access to all food and medicine going into the country. So as you can see, the administration, President Biden, are trying to walk a very fine diplomatic line, um, condemning some of uh, Israel's actions, especially after the death of uh, World Central Kitchen aid workers last week, but also trying to uh, get the international community to pressure Hamas into a ceasefire and the release of hostages. Enrique Acevedo, you covered a lot of ground in the interview. And to get the interview, we thank you for your time. Thank you so much. Relatives of American hostages held captive by Hamas met with Vice President Kamala Harris this afternoon. One of those family members whose son was kidnapped joins us next. You're streaming America Decides. Welcome back to America Decides. As we told you earlier, Vice President Harris met today with relatives of American hostages taken by Hamas, October 7th. Let's bring in Jonathan Dekalchen from the White House. His son has been captive, has been a hostage ever since October 7th. Jonathan, you met with the Vice President. What was your big takeaway from that meeting? What did you learn or what did you hear that was most striking? Well, uh, Scott, I would go more with the... Uh less with the details than the sort of the general the general atmosphere uh, our private conversations up to now with administrative uh, with administration officials have, have remained uh, have remained private and I think that's important to note because we have a kind of active partnership with them uh, from the vice president we heard um, 
absolute support and absolute understanding and listening, listening to us. Uh, we were absolutely heard today with our concerns, our fears, our curiosity about uh, how the administration is moving forward. And we got some more clarity as well about the, the deal, the hostage deal that is on the table now and awaits Hamas's response. What are you telling the administration officials you'd like the U.S. and Israeli governments to do? Well, I think the, the U.S. administration, we'll, we'll start with the easier part. Uh, the U.S. administration clearly from, from you know, the day after the, the massacre on October 7th, we, we've felt entirely supported by the U.S. administration and uh, the door has been open. And what we've asked for, what we've suggested uh, over time has certainly been well received by the administration. Uh, they are at maximum effort. We, we have no doubt the, 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 the deal that has been tabled right now and that uh, has gone back to Hamas's leadership is a U.S. initiative. So we really couldn't ask for more on that account. It remains to be seen if, God forbid, Hamas rejects, as it has before, uh, this deal, we will have to gather again with the U.S. administration to see what comes next. As far as the Israeli, administra the, uh, Israeli government I is concerned, we have had, as Israeli-American citizens, we have had our concerns as to how serious uh, Benjamin Netanyahu's government is truly uh, engaged in getting the hostages back versus the conduct of the war against Hamas. Um, what we have seen is that uh, through this deal and through Israeli agreement to, to this deal that was uh, now proposed to Hamas, that the Israeli government has gotten the idea and, and does understand that it needs to come to the table, it needs to negotiate, and it will probably demand some kind of painful compromise. After all, we're dealing with a murderous terrorist organization in Hamas um, that in some, in some senses is, has the final say here. But uh, we've been encouraged in, in recent days by the willingness of, of the Israeli government to do those things that it must to move this process forward to get the hostages home alive. Your son, Sagi, who is himself a father has now been captive for at least six months and two days. Um, what's the last proof of life you've been given for your son? The last proof of life came with uh, some of the released hostages. If you recall, in late November, early December, a group of 100 of the hostages were released in an, uh, an earlier deal. Of those 100, about 40 women and children were from my kibbutz, kibbutz near Oz, which is on the border with Gaza. And a number of the women and a couple of the teenagers were able to report to us that they had encountered Sagi a couple days before their release in the hellhole tunnels underneath Gaza. It's true also for many of the other hostages who we knew were alive at the time. The tragedy, of course, is that, as we learned a couple of days ago, with the announcement of the murder of Elad Katsir, who was also a 47-year-old man, a friend, uh, a, another member of our kibbutz, that is no guarantee. A proof of life from months ago is absolutely no guarantee um, of the health and safety of any of the hostages. So uh, the urgency is clear. Whatever we knew uh, uh, months ago really has no bearing on, on what might be their condition right now. After meeting with the vice president on the north lawn of the White House now, Jonathan Dekelchen, I'm sorry we have to keep speaking under these circumstances, but we appreciate your making time for us and your continued advocacy. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for keeping public eye on this on this issue. That does it for today. We're back with another edition of America Decides tomorrow at 5 p.m. Eastern. You're streaming CBS News.